In the ancient district of Furstat, Amr ibn al az the conqueror, built a mosque on the site of his tent on the battlefield where he won Egypt in 641 AD. The first mosque and the first university of Egypt. It has been added to, restored and preserved by the devoted gifts of millions of Muslims. To this day, the country's leaders come on the last Friday of the fast of Ramadan as a tribute to its special status as the first mosque in Egypt. In plan, it follows the usual one of a courtyard surrounded by colonnades. 366 columns of marble, each one different, form the aisles or Ewan. Like all mosques, it is not only a place of prayer, but also a school and a hospital. It is a hostel for the poor and the stranger, especially for pilgrims passing through Egypt on their way to Mecca. The son of the great general, Ibn el Az, lies here in this mausoleum. When the Muslims brought law and order to the banks of the Nile, they constructed new Nilometers, like the one built on the island of Rhoda by the Caliph Suleiman. After centuries of neglect, precise measurements were once again made of the varying height of the Nile to govern the agricultural seasons and control the use of its precious waters. It was from here that the Sheikh in charge proclaimed the annual festival, or Wafa el Nil, when the floods came and it was time to open the irrigation channels. The oldest complete mosque in Cairo is the enormous one by Ahmed ibn Tulun in 878. 500 feet long with 21 doors and 129 windows. The ancient gateway leads into the great quadrangle, the San El Gami, where stands the unique tower with its external stone staircase up which the Sultan is said to have ridden his horse each day. The courtyard, a hundred yards square, is surrounded by the colonnaded Ewans, magnificently decorated and with a wooden frieze said to be part of Noah's Ark brought from Mount Ararat. Here too, the mosque serves as a school and a hostel and as a center for social gatherings. Each one of its many windows is different, while the Mirab niche of marble is enriched by Byzantine gold mosaic. But much has been stolen and sold in Europe. Inside the grounds of the Ibn Tulun Mosque stands Anderson's house. It is really two houses, one built by El Ghazar in 1631 and known as the Cretlier, the Cretan lady's house after a former inhabitant, the other built by El Adad in 1540 and now a museum. The sundial tells the faithful the nine hours of prayer. This balconied room overlooks the courtyard of the Cretan lady's house. It has all been carefully preserved as a faithful example of the 17th century. The collection of objets d'art from all Egyptian ages and the interior of the picture gallery represent the good taste of the period. Everywhere there are beautiful examples of the delicate and intricate carved wood. But this cupboard is not only a cupboard, it gives access to a secret room whence the owner can look down into the great hall. Where, under the superbly decorated ceiling, stands the throne, facing the indoor fountain whose tinkling waters cool the noonday heat. The name of El Azar has a magic all of its own. For a thousand years, this mosque, called the Splendid Mosque, and its university have been the center of Islamic faith and learning. Built in 970 AD, it is the most important monument of the Fatimite period and a living college for countless generations of students. Ten thousand students reside here and work in the libraries pursuing their courses of studies which last for 17 years until they are sufficiently proficient in all branches of learning to be awarded the diploma which qualifies them to teach in any similar university. So the minarets of El Azhar are the lodestone of every Muslim student. The five minarets which show the inventive genius of their various architects in creating these columns of beauty and grace to the greater glory of God.
within the great courtyard, more than two acres in area, the judges and historians, the leaders of the land and of the faith, have learned their wisdom. Amid the 140 columns in the nine aisles of the sanctuary, the students form little groups about their professors, where for centuries have echoed the footsteps of the great and the learned. For in Islam, the learned are the great, and the students of today find inspiration in the historic stones around them. The first lectures were given here exactly a thousand years ago. The madrasa, or college of Tiberiae, was founded in 1309 AD. Another college of the university, the Akbugaya Madrasa, was founded in 1340 AD. So, through the ages, has El Azhar grown in size, in beauty, and in reputation. As in all these schools, here the many scholars seek out and choose their own tutors, who conduct their classes not in formal schoolrooms, but in the courtyards and amid the colonnades. Bab means gate, so the Bab El Nasra is one of the great gates of the old city built by El Nasra in the 11th century, when cities had to be fortified against enemies. To the people of Cairo, the walls alone were not the sole protection, for they believed that the thousand minarets gave them additional security. Nearby stand the round bastions of another gate, the Bab el Futu, in a very different style, but of the same date. Its ram's head decorations remind one of the sacred rams of ancient Thebes. Between the gates stands the contemporary wall built by Jamali, designed with ramparts and loopholes and every device to repel the invaders. When the gates were being built, El Hakim Amarala built his mosque between them, yet another minaret to pierce the blue skies, and elaborate decorations and sacred inscriptions in Kufic. But this did not suffice to protect it from desecration during Napoleon's invasion, for his soldiers used it as a fort. Away to the south, on another gate, the Babzwele, stand the minarets of the Mosque El Monia, the most magnificent of its period. In the lane, known as Dar Bel Azvar, stands the beautiful El Zahimi house, built 300 years ago by Sheikh Abdel El Tablawi. A perfect example of the period with its carved wooden screens, its courtyards and its sequia, or water pump and mill. The mosque of El Agma is a graceful reminder of the decorative Fatimite period, the 10th and 11th centuries. The head of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad lies at rest in the mausoleum of Al Hussein which is, in consequence, one of the most sacred places, and his birthday is celebrated with great festivities every year. In the 13th century, El Zahu Bibars, the most able ruler of his Mameluk dynasty, annihilated the remnants of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and returned to Cairo after four victorious campaigns to build his mosque out of the marble and wood from the citadel of Jaffa, which he captured. But centuries later, the French destroyed all its beauty and their guns thundered from its shattered windows. Now patient craftsmen are repairing the damage, slowly and painstakingly restoring its former glories. And the peace of its garden. Sultan Kalaun, who succeeded Bibas, built his mosque and hospital where once stood the refuse dumps of old Cairo, famous for its rich inlays of mother of pearl. Nearby, 
towers the minaret of El Nasser's school. The mosque built by the Emir El Naziri in 1347 is known as the Blue Mosque. For beneath its minaret, its walls and ceilings are rich with a dazzling array of blue ceramic tiles in all the wild beauty and endless variety of the Mameluk period. Reaching a unique beauty in the mausoleum of the Emir Mustafizan, the Sultan Hassan, son of Kalaun, built a school of the four rites in 1359 and a mosque. By common consent, this is the finest Islamic building in the world. The entrance leads to a courtyard around which are the library and accommodation for teachers and students. And in the centre, the San or ablution fountain in coloured marbles. The doors are inlaid with copper and gold. Another important school is the Kanka, or Quranic school, built by Farag ibn Barkuk, the son of the founder of the Circassian Mameluk dynasty in 1410. Its twin domes carved in stone in geometrical motifs, and its twin minarets epitomize its beauty. This monument to Sultan El Azraf was built by that great builder, the Sultan Kayat Bey, with its graceful and elegant minaret. And its windows of characteristic design. One of the most venerated saints of the Muslim world is El Badawi, whose simple and scholarly life was dedicated to God. When Napoleon invaded Egypt, he did not hesitate to allow his cavalry horses to desecrate the sacred ground of El Azhar. But he gave special orders that there must be no such desecration of the mosque where the saintly El Badawi is buried. For he knew that if this were done, the whole Muslim world would have risen against him in defense of the memory of their beloved saint. Abul Abbas was another saint. He is commemorated in the mosque named after him in Alexandria. Near the walls of old Cairo stands the fort of Kayat Bay. The small cells around its quadrangle were inhabited by dervishes. On the island of Rhoda, in the middle of the Nile stands the Maniel Palace, new because it was built only 60 years ago, but old because it is a veritable museum in its architecture and its contents. It was decreed that its several wings should be in the different styles of Persian, Ottoman, Moorish and Islamic. In its interiors are carved and painted ceilings of a rare craftsmanship, rooms of exquisite proportions furnished with an Eastern splendor. Great windows look out onto the gardens, 17 acres. Laid out around the house with a remarkable collection of rare species of trees and shrubs, and tropical plants which were collected from faraway places in an endless variety of strange shapes. Attached to the Maniel Palace is a mosque. In this haven of graceful peace, it is good to pause a while to let one's thoughts wander over the long vista of a thousand years 
over the centuries of history marked by the minarets and domes which speak of the passing centuries, of faith and hope expressed in their many styles and periods, and of the people who built them with devoted craft and skill. In early Islamic times, it was forbidden to portray living or dead creatures. It is for this reason that their skill was expressed in the infinite variety of geometric and abstract designs and the use of decorative inscriptions, which characterizes the best of their architecture. For those who expressed their faith in the Turkish style, is the Suleiman Pasha Mosque of the 16th century. As recently as the 19th century, the skyline of Cairo was pierced with the minarets of the Alabaster Mosque. The twin, pencil-thin minarets crowning the citadel of Cairo. Its dome shines against the blue skies high above the city, looking down on the thousand minarets of yesteryears. Muhammad Ali lies bedded in the mausoleum in the shadow of the mosque he built of that same alabaster as the ancient pharaohs used for their eternal monuments. Inside burn 365 lamps beneath the great dome, flickering the lights upon the rich decorations and upon those who come to look and wonder. So, by the creation of these mosques and tombs, colleges and hospitals, Cairo has been given its proud title of the City of a Thousand Minarets. <laughs>